Uh, this? No, 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 no. This is not for cheating at cards. This is, uh, this is from my physical therapist. Is anyone buying this? My name is Ben Seidman. I'm a magician, pickpocket, and sleight of hand artist. This is my second Vanity Fair video breaking down magic and sleight of hand in film and TV. But people have a lot of questions, so today all will be revealed. Let's get into it. The wonderful story of Henry Sugar. Slowly, magically, but distinctly, a black blob becomes a spade, a twisty squiggle becomes a five. The five of spades. Fingers quivering, he picks up the card and turns it over. I've done it, he says. I love this story, and I love that Roald Dahl based the character off a real person, Kuda Bucks, the man with x-ray eyes. In this great movie, Benedict Cumberbatch's character learns a skill which allows him to do this effect without trickery. If you're gonna fake this effect, the easiest way to do it would be with a gambler's deck of marked cards. Think of it as a deck of cards that's face up and face down at the same time. Marked cards were developed to cheat at card games, but magicians tend to avoid them, and here's why. One, if you get caught, you lose all your credibility. Two, sometimes someone hands me a deck of cards and asks to see magic, and I can't just be like, oh yeah, I'd love to do a magic trick for you. Let me just use my special deck of cards instead. And three, a really good magician could take any trick that they would do with a marked deck of cards and do it with a, a normal deck of cards. So it's just not worth the hassle for any of us. Oh, and why else do we not use marked cards? People know about them. The back of the next card to be dealt lay clearly visible. The dealer hadn't touched it. Yes, Henry said. Another card. The dealer shrugged and dealt it. The two of clubs landed neatly in front of Henry alongside the ten and the nine. Don't you want The dealer said evenly. His black eyes glanced up again into Henry's face and rested there, silent, watchful. There are different types of card marking that have existed in the world of gambling. First, there's Dab. Dab is a chemical or kind of oily substance that you put a little on your thumb and as you're playing, you can mark the back of certain cards. There are also printed gimmick decks where you shift your depth of focus to read the marks, like a magic eye poster. This is what one of those decks looks like. If I shift my depth of focus, I can see some of the marking system. This is a card puncher. Uh, gambling cheats can use this to punch little divots in cards. So like Braille, they can feel specific playing cards as they're playing and identify them. And if you see someone playing cards wearing a green visor, that could be allowing them to see a mark on one of the cards that is otherwise invisible to the naked eye. Cards can also be naturally marked due to anomalies in the printing process. Phil Ivey famously took advantage of an observed error within the printing and used them for a process known as edge sorting, keeping track of high and low cards in most cases. Looking back, I have to say I love Benedict's commitment to what the superpower would actually look like. And I think Wes Anderson was the perfect director to give this story justice. The Prestige. Indeed, many of you may be familiar with this technique, but for those of you who aren't, do not be alarmed. What you're about to see is considered safe. In this movie, the trick is called The Transported Man. It's a translocation effect, which is one of my favorite plots in magic. Magic is both an art and a science. One of my mentors, Armando Luciero, was once performing a translocation effect with a coin and two cards. He would place the cards on the table, put the coin underneath one of the cards, and it would travel to underneath the other card. After he performed it, a man in the audience stepped forward and asked if he could sign his name on the coin. By signing his name on the coin, the man was confirming for himself that there was only one coin being used because he would be able to verify his own signature. Signing the coin closes a door very deliberately. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's pretty close to a perfect miracle. But the man who had signed his name on the coin said, oh, now I know how it doesn't work. For that man, proving that there was only one coin being used was the tipping point, and the feeling of wonder had decreased instead of increased. As always, kudos to Christopher Nolan and deceptive practices. The magic in this film is top notch. Shade. One of the producers said to me, hey, that thing on Stallone's arm, that isn't real, is it? They made that for the movie? Nope. That absolutely is a real thing. It's called a Keplinger. Using one of these in a game is known as playing the joint. These were actually used by crooked gamblers back in the day, but the Keplinger, it became antiquated shortly after its invention. Why? 
If you get caught with one of these things in a poker game, that's a death sentence. It would be very difficult to explain your way out of this. Oh, this? Yeah, uh, this? No, 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 no. This is not for cheating at cards. This is, uh, this is from my physical therapist. Is anyone buying this? But the engineering is really cool. And there are certainly card cheats who have used these things and devices like it when it comes to switching cards in and out of play. I should also mention that this is worn under a jacket. You don't just walk into the card game like, hey guys, who wants to play a friendly game? Games of chance. Not the way we play. Seconds, centers, bottoms, stacking the deck, mucking cards. In the first few frames of that clip, we saw Expert at the Card Table, which is a book from 1902 that teaches anything and everything cheating at cards. Interestingly enough, the author of this book has remained a mystery for over a century, but it has plenty of switching techniques designed for the cheat. Now, gamblers and magicians switch cards in very different ways, but there's a huge similarity. Both need to appear natural, but within the context of the situation. When I'm performing, I create my own context, which gives me so much more leeway than someone cheating at cards. A gambler, for example, would never switch cards like this. No, if you want to risk your life cheating at cards, you would need a method that fits within the natural movements of gameplay. This is a deep, deep rabbit hole, but I find it frustrating because I keep trying to get a card game going and no one returns my calls. <laughs> Focus. This movie is a great example of producers listening to experts and actors actually putting in the work. But let's back up. The reason why the pickpocketing in this movie is so epic and so realistic, it's Apollo Robbins and Ava Doe. This film is really personal to me because a lot of the pickpocketing that I perform on stage comes from studying with Apollo. Let's start with the language here. Shade. That's covering the steel and blocking the eyeline of onlookers and the mark. The stick holds the mark in position. Fanning means to touch the mark, looking for the poke. A poke is the wallet or item of value that is being targeted for the steel. A Pratt poke, Pratt is an old timey British term. In this case, it's referring to a wallet in the back pocket. I'm going to break down the steels in this scene, but please understand, this is not a tutorial. Do not attempt to use any of these techniques. Doing so may result in your A, getting thrown in jail, B, getting punched in the face, C, getting thrown in jail and punched in the face, or D, a career in the arts. Let's start with the lens lift. She acts as both the stick and the shade for the lens lift. This is very good realistic blocking. Then he asks her if, if she wants to wire. You want to wire? Let me wire. Wire is another term for the tool, the dip, the mechanic, who's ever doing the steal. Next is the Pratt poke. The mark is bumped and she does the extraction. Notice that she's stealing from someone wearing loose fitting jeans. When I bring someone up on stage during my show to steal from, I'm always looking at the cut of their clothing. One of the reasons that these types of steals have become more rare is that pants have gotten skinnier and skinnier over the years, which makes pants pockets very tight and difficult to steal from. The truth is stealing from a guy wearing skinny jeans is hard because it's easier for him to feel it. So baggy pants are always better. I think pickpocketing had its heyday in the 90s. Sorry, MC Hammer. You can actually touch a lot of things in those pants. <laughs> Next, the steal out of the purse with the chopsticks. This is actually real. You can find surveillance footage from some countries where pickpockets use chopsticks. Unlike some other tools which can aid in the extraction, chopsticks can't be prosecuted as a burglary tool. So I totally buy this. The hip pack steal is actually one of my favorites in the entire movie. It's 100% real, 100% believable, and we get to see Ava Doe make a cameo. In pickpocket terms, there's often someone who takes the stolen goods out of sight. That way, if the steal is spotted by anyone, there's no proof because the stolen goods were passed off. The term for the person who leaves with the goods is the Duke man. Here we see Ava working as the Duke man. 
That watch steal was way too fast, but I'm guessing that Margot Robbie learned the steal for real, and then the speed was due to a camera cut, not the choreography. How to treat a lady. There's another Pratt poke with some flair, and we see him catch the wallet and drop it into his hat. That is, of course, Apollo Robbins on camera. Oh, this is a double steal. She's working his leather and his ring at the same time. That moment is definitely enhanced for dramatic effect. You would never see a wire steal both of those things at the same time, but they're using this moment to tell the story of Margot's character growing in confidence and in speed. Finally, let's talk about eye contact. A thief on the street never wants to make eye contact with their mark. If they get caught, they could be identified later. That being said, I think if most people were grabbed by Margot Robbie, they would remember it. There's a term for accidentally making eye contact with your mark. It's known as kissing the dog. When I steal things from people, it, it happens on stage during my show, so I don't need to avoid eye contact. So for me, this is kissing the dog. That's Juno. She's my everything. Arrested Development. My eye! Ah! Enjoy the Hanukkah cookie, man. Arrested is one of my all-time favorite shows, but any magic we see is intentionally the worst version of that trick. Could Ben Stiller have learned to do something that was truly impossible? Of course he could have, he's super talented. But it's not the right choice for the character. Pulling something out of your eye badly definitely is the funny choice. If I was gonna pull a Hanukkah cookie out of my eye, it might look something like this. That's actually, uh, that's actually a non-religiously affiliated winter cookie. It's a gluten-free secular treat. I think you should leave with Tim Robinson. All right, Charlie, I just want you to focus on which hand the ball is in, okay. and I'll give you a hint, it's not this one. Right here? God damn it, Charlie, it has one job. I'll give you one last chance. Which hand is it in? Uh, right here? No, Charlie, it's in your pocket. Give him a round of applause, it's Charlie! Jerry Seinfeld once said, all magic is, here's a quarter, now it's gone, you're a jerk. Now it's back, you're an idiot. Show's over. Jerry, you're wrong. That's not all magic, that's just bad magic. People in film and TV love to represent magicians as clueless, and I have a theory about this. I think that this is the fault of another trope from the 80s. During that time period, magic took the same turn as stand-up comedy. In the 80s, tons of comedy clubs opened and there was so much money to be made, so you had a lot of hacky performers. It's pretty clear that this sequence was written by a non-magician, and the actor who played the magician, shout out to Jerry Katzman, had to match the choreography to whatever was in the script. Most of the sequence is intended intentionally simple and therefore condescending. If the effect and execution was more sophisticated, the narrative just isn't as good. So how would this look if it was a bit more like a traditional magic routine? Lily, Lisa, do you know what this is? Trick question, no one does. It's a ball for your nose. Well, yeah, that's, it looks like a, a clown nose. Yeah. It's a, just a ball of, it's a ball of sponge. But uh, you can create sort of an, an optical illusion. So it looks like there's, uh, there's more than one. If you put your finger on it, does that make sense? No. Yeah, if you hold your finger down here, I'll, I'll show you. If you do this with your finger. Oh, wow. <laughs> it definitely looks like there's two. Lisa, do me a favor, uh, hold one of your hands up for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want you to hold on to the ball, but tightly. And then if you watch this one, and look, uh, I'll even roll up my sleeves so you don't think I'm cheating. Look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> Lily, would you hold that one of your hands for me? Beautiful. Hold on to both of them, but really tightly. Look really tightly. Put your other hand on top. Beautiful. Okay, turn your hand over and open them. <laughs> That's the desired response, is right there. I've spoken before about how magicians actively try to cancel out an audience's possible theories as they go. There's an old adage that magicians hide things in their sleeves. So often we roll up our sleeves to disprove that. I think it's fine performing SpongeBob magic in long sleeves because the audience realizes that an object like this would get caught going up the sleeve. So there are many other methods that have been devised to do a vanish. Besides, magicians don't really use their sleeves. That's a bit of a myth. Another misnomer, the hand is quicker than the eye. 
It's almost never speed, unless the magician is on speed. I did say that this character was inspired by the 80s. God damn it, Charlie. The notion that it's up his sleeve, the hand is quicker than the eye. I think these bits of misinformation were created by magicians who wanted to steer your thinking away from how the trick actually worked. The hand is quicker than the eye was always a straw man, just waiting to be torn down. Because now I can move slowly and fool you on a deeper level. It's just like that sign, beware of pickpockets. When you see that sign, you pat yourself down and the pickpocket who hung up that sign sees where you put your valuables. These ideas were printed, posted, and repeated by people who want you to believe something that is completely false. It's all part of the deception. As far as I'm concerned, more magic on screen. The more magic we see, the better. I hope this video gave you a deeper look at the world of mystery that I get to live in every day. Thank you for watching.